me as well so yeah okay yeah fantastic welcome welcome everybody really good to see you all here again for a very exciting shiur relating to a very unique hacham um as we usually do we'll do some quick housekeeping uh, i'm just going to see if i can share my self on the screen nope it won't work like that do you want to stop sharing just for a second rob sure uh, just for one second there we go and then there welcome everybody great to see you all so uh week 40 i don't i don't even know at the moment but i think it's 46 um really happy to have you all back here uh as i said a sure tonight on a hacham that a lot of us have heard about we've uh, come across not only his uh very detailed and thought-provoking teshubot but a hacham that was very very responsive to the changing realities of the modern period of history um when a lot of uh, you know elements of modernity were starting to take over the world um, and a lot of challenges were being faced by uh, Torah practicing halakhically oriented Jews. Uh, Hachameshas really stood out as a shining light to ensure that uh, commitment to Torah is not jeopardized by the rise of modernity. And to give this shur, we have a Rav who I had the pleasure, real, real pleasure of meeting virtually a few months ago uh, we've since built a very uh, you know cordial friendly relationship and uh, I, I learn a lot of wisdom from him and for me he is one of the young hachamim who is going to be a very 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 important hacham for the jewish world uh, remember me saying this on the 4th of may 2021 um, his name is rav yitzhak verdugo and he was born and raised in South Florida. He attended Yeshivat Bet Moshe Chaim in Miami Beach and Tiferet Torah in Monsi. Uh, while the Rav studied in New York, he received Semichaf on Yore Yore as well as a Kabbalah in Shachita from Rav Eliyahu Ben Chaim Shelita, who is the Av Bet Din of Mekor Chaim in Queens, New York. After moving back to Florida, he learned in the Choshen Mishpat Kolel of Florida under the Av Bet Din of Miami. And Rav Verdugo is also the founder of the Institute of Sephardic Halacha. And he is studying towards a Dayanut qualification through the Eretz Hemda Institute of Yerushalayim, as well as the Montefiore Endowment, who we all know well. Rabbi Berdugo currently resides in Miami Beach, Florida, and he serves as a Rosh Kolel of the Bal Harbor Kolel. Rabbi Berdugo, thank you so much for making it uh, here with us tonight. And uh, a lot of us are familiar with you through the WhatsApp group that you've got on Hacham Meshach's <laughs> Teshubot. Uh, so thank you, and Bechavo, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Sina. It's a tremendous opportunity. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to share about Rav Yosef Mishash. There, there are different ways to pronounce his name. Some say Rav Yosef Mashash. Some say Mishash. Some say Misas. I'm not sure myself, but we'll go with Rav Yosef Misas today. Um, Rav Yosef Misas is uh, very dear to me as a Rav. I actually. What happened was I went to Israel once when I was in yeshiva there after high school, post high school. And I went to a bookstore that I found out called Sifre Sfaradim of Rabbi Abitbol. I don't know if anybody knows about that, but it's a, it's a bookstore of all Sfardi, uh, Sfarim. And one of the two books I bought was uh, a little Likut from Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yosef Misas. I have it here somewhere. Right now I took out all my, like maybe I have 15 books of Rabbi Misas on my desk right now all over the place. I got a little Likut from uh, about Rav Yosef Misas. I never used it until years later where I got uh, more exposed to him, seeing other people bring him down. And uh, I started reading it and getting more and more into it. And it's one of these Rabbanim that I'm sure everybody here can relate to. There are certain Rabbanim that you just, you, you hear them speak or you, you read their Torah and it's just like, wow, that, you have this feeling that I'm proud to be Jewish. This, this Rabbi makes me proud to be Jewish, you know? I recently felt that again with uh, Rabbi Dweck when I hear Shurim, or when I hear Rabbi Yonatan Alevi when I hear Shurim. There's many Rabbanim, Baruch Hashem, or Rabbi Livnat when I'm sitting in uh, uh, with Teres Hemda. There's certain Rabbanim you're just like, wow, this is, uh, this is what I'm going to connect to. This is what it's all about. So Rabbi Yosef Meshash, he definitely left that imprint in me. And uh, hopefully I can be a Zochet to deliver 
a little tipa, a little bit of who he was. Um, I just wanted to, if you can follow along with uh, the PowerPoint, just a little shevach to the habura, to what uh, everybody here is doing and joining together. I'm sure the, the more seasoned uh, Talmidim, they know about this famous Rambam. Can you guys read everything okay properly in the screen? Yeah. I don't think the screen's just been shared yet. Oh, that's right. Okay. Good point. Very good point. Okay. I'm not so good with Zoom. Let me share the screen. Okay, there we go. Okay. Perfect. Rabbi Yosef Mishash. Okay. From 1892 to 1974. Okay, so if you can read clearly, for like I was mentioning before that the season Hachamim would probably know this Rambam. I'm sure Rabbi Duek brought it many times in Pirush Mishnayot. That the Rambam he brings down before he starts Perik uh, Shmona Pirakim. It's about uh, Perush on on uh, on Pirkei Avot. And he says like this: Vedaki Adivarim Sheomer BePirakim Malalu UBeMashi Yavi Mina Perush. Everything I'm going to bring here, Enam Inyanim Sheidashtim Mani Belibi. They're not things that I myself came up with. I didn't invent them. Rather, they're things that I collected from all different sources of Hazal, of the Hachamim. And it says here, and also from philosophers, from the early ones, from the more modern ones during his time, and also from other authors from different types of realms of Hachma. And he ends off with this, and accept the truth from whoever says it. Receive the truth. Live with the truth. Take the truth and go with it from whoever it says. It doesn't matter who it was. I think, uh, Sina, maybe if you guys want a slogan for your the Habura, this is a nice slogan. This is what I think the Habura is all about. And I'm happy that uh, we found a place, uh, that I found a place with you guys, meeting a very similar-minded people. And uh, just some words of Shevach that I'm very happy to be part of you guys and to meet more people in Bezat Hashem. We look forward to meeting a lot of people in real life, in person, Bezat Hashem. All righty. Okay, so another Shemua, that this also, this, this teaching really changed my life. And when Sina asked me to speak about Rav Mishash, I was going to maybe just go and random Teshuvah or pick one. You know, I have, once a week, we or try to do once a week, we try to do a different Teshuvah. And the, you can, there's, he wrote thousands and thousands of thousands of teshuvot we're going to see. And we can just jump into it at teshuvah, but I thought my, to myself, I'm like, you know what? It's better if we kind of get to know who Chacham Meshash was first, get a taste of who he was, see who he was as a person, as a Tamir Chacham, as a scholar. And then we can kind of, maybe if I, if I pass the test, maybe uh, and I, I speak again, we can get into more teshuvot. So, so this, this, Yigushalmi is a very important Yigushalmi. It says like this, Ha'omer shimua b'shem omra. When you are relating something that somebody else said, another hacham said, yireh bal shimua kilu omer lenegdo. You have to envision that that hacham, that rabbi, the person who said it, as if he is standing in front of you. I remember you had uh, Rabbi Sutton on talking about the Sephardic approach of learning Gemara. Um, and one of them that he talked about is the academic approach of trying to, you know, learning about each Amora, each Tana, each Rabbi who said something. So it, it's, you, you can find in the Yushalmi itself. This, I think, in essence, what it's saying is that when you're learning the Torah of somebody, you have to know who the Bal Shimua is. You have to know who the author is. You have to be able to envision him, know who he is. And only through that way, after really understanding him personally, and you know his background information, everything about him, his shita, then you can actually really appreciate and really truly understand what he was trying to say. So this is just a, a hagdama in order to get into the biography and learn a little about who, who Rav Mishash was. All right, so Rav Mishash was from Meknes. Meknes was a city in northern, central northern Morocco. It was a city that Believe it or not, it was there were Jews there all the way from from the time of Bayit Rishon. Could be even before, maybe after. But from Bayit Rishon, 
they have they have ancient synagogues there even before for, for sure they, it, it was a, a community there before uh, islam started taking over morocco and the north africa and the way Ramishash and a few of his other haverim we'll call them got to meknes is they came you had two groups of jews in morocco you had the migurashim and the toshavim and the migurashim were the Jews that they came from Sfarad. They weren't native to Morocco. You have the Toshavim, the Toshavim, I should start with them. The Toshavim were the ones living in Morocco from the time of, let's say, Bayit Rishon, the time of Shlomo HaMelech, et cetera. But the Toshavim were the Jews that came from Sfarad, mostly from Castilia. I know we're big into Andalus, but uh, most Moroccans, they came from Castilia here. And they came to, that with that, methodology with that shita of learning they came to spain sorry they came to morocco and there was a war it actually happened in many sephardic countries in syria there was wars between the different communities of the locals the toshavim and the migurashim it happened all over all over the sephardic lands even in iran you had jews coming from spain and coming and changing minagim of the the toshavim of that land so the jews came the toshavim the migurashim they came to spain sorry they came to morocco and most of them settled in Fez. Fez was the capital of that time during the explosion of the, after the Inquisition. But in Fez, you can see through many teshuvot of early hachamim, there was a very bad, terrible plague that hit Fez very strongly. And due to that plague, there's many teshuvot in Agunot, etc. many things that happened. And a lot of Jews, specifically a lot of the scholarly Tamir Hachamim, they actually chose and they went to Meknes. They went to Meknes. So famous families, first and foremost, the Berdugo family. <laughs> um, you have also the Toledano family. You have the Mishash family, Amar family. There's plenty of, plenty of Tamir Hachamim in Meknes. Uh, if you go, there's Kevarim all over the place. And they were really, they called it like the mini Yushalayim there in Meknes. So that's a little bit background information about Meknes, where he lived. So in Meknes, okay. So in Meknes, Rav Mishash, Rav Yosef Mishash, he was raised with some serious, serious Tamir Hachamim in the yeshiva there that they had. And the yeshiva wasn't the style of yeshiva that we have nowadays, but it was more in a little bit midrash, a little small room. You get to do shimush, you get to learn with serious Tamir Hachamim. So one of his main rabbanim was Yosef Al Kowi. As well as you have Chaim Berdugo, and here are the pictures that I get. So at least you can get a, a, a taste of how they dressed and the, the kiddusha. You just saw, when when I look at these pictures, these old hachamim, you just just by looking at them, you absorb something. They're just the clothing they would wear and the snoot that they would have, and there's something about it. So these were his main rabbanim. And believe it or not, this rabbi here, rabbi, this was the Rosh Shiva in Meknes. And his name was Rav Zev Wolf Halpern. Rav Zev Wolf Halpern doesn't have a Moroccan name. And he actually was an Ashkenazi that came to Morocco. And he really changed the entire yeshiva system in Morocco. We're going to see from this letter that Rav Yosef Mishash wrote about Rabbi Halpern. Rabbi Halpern, he came from, from England, believe it or not. And he was born in Russia, came to England. He was a Talmud of Rav Dessler. And he came out of outreach. He wanted to go and set up the yeshivot, give structure to the yeshivot in Morocco, all over the place in Morocco, from Tangier, uh, Casablanca, all over the place. He set up yeshivot in Morocco. And he never, uh, there's a false claim. A lot of uh, other Sfaradim, they like to make fun of the Moroccans that they became Ashkenazi, but it's not true at all. We can uh, talk about it another time. But all he did was give structure to how to incorporate Limud Torah in a modern world where we're going to see that the French came to, to Morocco and changed the life of everybody. Before, it was a very simple life in the old days. And then the French came and they revolutionized life and gave electricity and more opportunities for everybody, more liberal life approach of life. So Rab, Rab, Zev, Lelf, Rab, Rab Zev Wolf Halpern, he came and he really gave a direction of kind of the system they had in Europe and brought it to Morocco. So I just want to read a little bit of what he said by Meshash and Otsana Mikhtavim. I should have talked about all the different Sfarim he has, but uh, off the top of my head, I know around 19 Sfarim he has. He has little ones, big ones, and there's many other things that he has as well. But 
in Otsar Mikhtavim, which is a collection of all the letters that he wrote, which is mind boggling how many letters he wrote all over the place, being busy. And at, at the same time, we're going to see is he had rabbinical positions, but he wrote letters, tremendous amount of letters. He wrote this about, about Rabbi Halpern. He says, When the French came to our city, a new lifestyle came in our world. So those who call it a beautiful new season, a new lifestyle, they're not making a mistake. However, but those who call it bad, they're also not making a mistake. Why? Because now we have more peace in the world. There's more you know, civilization in the world. However, that certain state of mind of peacefulness, internal peacefulness, and just being tranquil and happy with what you have, that changed completely when the French came in. Why? And we can all relate to this, how we all live in this modern Western society. Because the excessive lifestyle took over everybody. With clothing and jobs, and all your, the, where you're living, as well as all the needs for your house, all the new technology, and as well by the children, by the women. They got a new, there was a women revolution as well, and for children as well, they had more things to do now and more capabilities and opportunities. And therefore, this created an entire world of, of more putting more effort into your, this new lifestyle and being more competitive and trying to make more money. Everybody went and tried to do competition. I'm trying to make a little kitsur. Everybody was trying to be wise and see how they can make it and make more and get more. Everybody wanted to get more money. Before in the old days, you had a small shop, open for two hours, one hour, you're good to go. Now the French came in, they brought an economy, they have system, there's schooling, there's business school, university, everything's changing now. Okay? Things are more competitive. Said whether they were doing it in a mutar or in Easter way, everybody tried to fulfill their desires of living in this new culture. Everybody saying, whatever the new things are, let's let's get to them, let's do it. And he says, This is what, what happened too in the world of Torah. This was pretty much the Haskalah for the for the Sephardic Jews, the Moroccan Jews, especially. Those who even knew the Torah and were learning Torah and serious about Torah. They started separating from what they were raised under. Each person started to do their own things, their own business. Because they also wanted to go and taste from this new lifestyle. And therefore the world of Torah started getting weaker. There was nobody to bring us up and help us and keep us strong in Torah, in the world of Torah. However, Hashem, our Savior, He actually saved us with His amount of mercy and He brought to us an amazing shidduch from somewhere, somewhere across the sea. Meir London, from London. Birat Britannia, from Britain. And he was a Russian Jew originally. He was born in Russia. Mar Nihu Rabba. He was. This is an expression for a great rabbi. Dechaylele bekabba Rabba. He was uh, an amazing person. Hacham bechumato, tremendous in wisdom. Sadik beunato, purely righteous. Gomer hasidim tovim. Always give good to do good to other people. Zachav zechayet rabim. Always wanted to help merit every for everybody to merit the rabim. Kevod Moreno Rabenu Harav Rabbi Zev Wolf Halpern. He says, this is the rabbi that came and such an in, change and in, in, in created such an impact, an everlasting impact on the life of Rabbi Shash and as well as all the Moroccan Jews. He really saved a lot of the B'nai Torah, all the B'nai Torah. If we read the Teshuvah, he actually has two pages just talking about how the Seder Yom was, how he set up the Yeshiva. 
Of course, he never changed the hashkafa and the derech alimur, how they approached anything. Rather, what he do? He even put the the, the rabbi Rav Chaim Berdugan, Rav Rav uh, uh, Al Kubi. He he caused them to be the rosh yeshiva and to be in charge of everything. He just gave a certain structure that was able to to continue in the world in the olam of this new French Revolution. Okay. So now we have Yosef Meshash, a little bit about him. He was a Dayan, sorry, he's the son of a Dayan, Chaim Meshash, would be Chaim Meshash. He wrote a sefer, Nishmat Chaim. And Nishmat Chaim, actually, Rabbi Yosef Meshash had to go and publish it himself. He had to go and find it. It was, it was supposedly, it was, uh, it was lost. And he went and was Melaket and get, he got different teachings from different Talmidim of his father. And the reason is because Rav Chaim passed away when Rav Yosef was 12 years old. So at 12 years old, Rav Yosef Meshash, he lost his father, who was a tremendous Dayan in Meknes, and who he himself had many Talmidim. And since that happened, Rav Yosef Meshash, at a young age, he had to go and support his family. He learned art, calligraphy. He was a sofer. He did book binding. He worked like most uh, Jews back then anyways as well. So Rav Meshash, Rav Yosef Meshash, or Mesas, sorry, I'm already confusing it. He got smicha from, at least these are four of them that I found. These are smicha, he got smicha from these rabbanim. First of all, Rav Rafael Ankawa, he was the chief rabbi. Oh, do you see my, the pictures of everybody when I'm, when I'm sharing screen? Oh, you see me moving it around though? Oh no, like your faces as well on my screen? Because it's getting in the way. Okay, fine. Oh no, you don't. Oh, oh I could put it up here. Okay. So, oh, Rabbi Yonatan Alevi is here. That is too nerve wracking. <laughs> So Rabbi Rafael Ankawa, he was the Rav Rashi of, of Morocco. He was a chief rabbi in Morocco. So he, Rav uh, Yosef Meshash got smicha from him. Rav Shlomo Eben Danan, he was a Rav Bedin of Fez. He also got smicha. Rav Eben Danan, it's an interesting family, their Yehus. They traced their Yehus back to the Talmud. Uh, the, actually, they themselves, they claim they were Ben Ahar Ben of the Rambam. And it was a very famous family of Hachamim in Morocco. It's an interesting story how they got from the, because we know that uh, Rabbi Avram bin Rambam, they went to Mitzrayim, but how some of the Talmudim, they went back, some of the, of the descendants of the Rambam, they went to Morocco after. You have Rabbi Yaakov Toledano, he was the Avbedin of Mekdes, and Rabbi Yaakov Toledano, for those who don't know, his son was Rabbi Rafael Baruch Toledano, one of the great Hachamim of Morocco as well. And we're going to see that the, they were very close with Rabbi Yosef Mishash as well. And Rabbi Yoshua Birdugo, who was also the the Rosh uh, the Rabbi Rashi of Meknes, and he later became also the chief rabbi of Morocco after Rabbi Rafael Ankawa. So these were serious hachamim. All of them have tremendous farim. Some of them, unfortunately, they're not known as farim, but they're there. And Bezat Hashem, we will uh, bring some of this farim back again. But these were tremendous, tremendous tamidah hachamim that they all, Rabbi Meshash, had connection with them, got smicha from them, tested by them, and had a kesha with them. Okay, so... There's a biography about Rabbi Meshash called Zehayom. And we're going to see why it's called Zehayom. And I'm bringing a few shemuot, some, some lines from that sefer. So he says, So when Rabbi Meshash was only 16 years old, he already started to send responsa to different Tamir Chachamim, she'elot to different Chachamim. And whenever he would sign off, he would sign off, Ani Hayom. Uh, back in the old days, all this Faridi Rabbanim, I'm not sure if they still do it nowadays, they would have a little, they would create a nice little uh, a, a crypto name for them to remember how the, who, who they are. And they would, of course, have a, a deep meaning to, to, towards them. And Ani Hayom represents Hatsair Yosef Meshash. I am the, the young, humble one, Yosef Meshash, and the Samichtet. Of course, the Samichtet, people like to say it's Faridi Tahor. Could be at some point they used it because of the the Moranos, uh, the convert converts. They used to say they used to write some to show that they were Jewish. However, it usually means sefetav that I should have a good ending or sintin, which is like ani afar ve'efer. I'm very humble. I'm I'm nothing. It's a way of showing that they're he's humble. So Rab Meshash, Rab Yosef Mesas, he got married at in 1908. He got married when he was 16 years old to Simcha HaKohen. And this actually, I found a picture of him randomly, and I confirmed it with one of the main Talmudim, Rabbi Yosef Mishash, that this, this was actually the wife, the, the wife of Rabbi Yosef Mishash. 
Uh, interesting, you know, everybody has, knows the famous teshuva about hair coverings, but you see his wife did wear a hair covering. And uh, in 1922, which is after 14 years, he wasn't able to have children. So he married another lady, Rachel Lakrif. I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, but he married this lady, Rachel Lakrif. So I also confirmed because I saw this online. I got this in a, on a website online. And the Lashon they use is Nasa Alea, that he married, besides the first wife, he married on top of that wife, he married Rachel. So it sounds like he had two wives at the same time. And I did confirm it. And the Talmud said that it's not something that's so known, but he did have two wives at the same time. He lived with Simcha, that was his main wife. And he just had the other wife just to, to bear children with. Um, for whatever the reason why that other wife agreed, why Rachel agreed, there was a certain reason as well. But his children, all his descendants come from Rachel, but his main wife was Simcha, which is an interesting thing to know. In general, in the old days in Morocco, you see many Teshuvot. And uh, within the 1800s, many people, many men still had multiple wives. It wasn't such a common thing, but it was still, you see in the Teshuvot of Dine Hoshe Mishpat and Evena Ezer, they were still marrying, they were still practicing polygamy. Yeah. Okay, so in 1923, when he was 30, 31 years old, he was anointed and asked to become the Rav of Tlemcen. Tlemcen is in Algeria. If you can see the picture, he moved from Meknes all the way to Tlemcen in a city in, in, uh, in a city in Algiers, and he was there for 18 years, and that's where he pretty much he became known to be Rav Yosef Mishash. He was already known at a young age, but when some when a when a rabbi gets authority and he has a name, oh, he is the rabbi of this city. He's a, then people. No matter who you are, they start. Oh, okay, he's a big rabbi. He's a, an elected official of a, of a rab. They're gonna. He has more credence and more. More uh, people are gonna give more ears to him. So there, he became extremely famous. Um, his uh, he says here the omikayun ve'achumash rabenu the the well the the wisdom of rabenu michtava v'hidusha v'mioton shanim ha'chilul itparsen ve'olam kula b'tzapon Africa. His teshuvot started going from Africa, from the north of Africa, to Eretz Israel, to Europa, even you have to New York. I, and if you open up Otsar Mikhtavim, you can, in the back, you just see from every city and every country where rabbis were asking questions from. And he was inundated with teshuvot and questions from all over the world. So, Shemon Odad Bekerev Kolaam Vafikir Godel Ador. He was known amongst everybody, and even the Gedole Ador knew him very well. So, one line there that it says in the in the sefer there of the Hayom, it says Rabbeinu Karev Yehudim Rabim LeTorah. He was very very into bringing Jews and making sure that they maintain and keep Torah as much as they can and keep the halacha and make sure that the hala the halacha is always sweet. Uh, I was talking to Rabbi Yonatan Alevi a couple of days ago and he was saying that the his whole purpose is to show that halacha is so sweet and that's Rabbi Yosef Mishash is an expression of that to show the sweetness and the sechir and the logic and svara of of halacha. And one story I heard from one of his great grandchildren, Rabbi Yosef Mishash, is that when he went to Tlemcen, he went to Algiers to become the rabbi there. Right away, one of the Balebat team told him there, he said, Listen, you can't eat at anybody's house here. Everybody's house here is Hashem Yazor, Kemat Teref. It's uh, not kosher. There's only one family you can go to. But even the president of the synagogue, you can't eat at his house. <laughs> you don't want to eat at his house. So Rav Yosef Meshash, he did something very wise. This was his, his uh, methodology of how to mikarev people. He went the first Shabbat, he went to the, the one family that showed me Shabbat and keep mitzvot and keep kashrut very well. He ate there. And then towards Mincha time, he went to the president of the synagogue. I don't know what it's called president, but the Rosh Bet Knesset, the head of the Bet Knesset. And he told him, he said, listen, the Shabbat, I ate at his house because his kashrut is very high level, very good level. Next Shabbat, I'm going to go to you because I know, you know you're in charge and everything. So I'm going to go to your house. And uh, it, it's known that they, they say that that, Shab that Erev Shabbat, that, uh, for that week, this president, he went, he kashered his entire kitchen. He made it top of the line kosher. And then Rabbi Meshash actually went and he ate at his house. He ate at this person's house where the other person said, don't eat at this guy's house. He went through his wisdom. He knew how to get him to keep kosher on the, the top level. He made everybody feel hashuv and, 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 and want to do Judaism. Okay, so it's Teshuvotav. So 
He has a Sefer Nahalat Avot, if you can see here. Nahalat Avot, it's I think seven, eight Krachim on Pirkei Avot that he would give the Rashot on, on Shabbat, on Pirkei Avot. And there, Rabbi Shalomo Amar, the previous uh, chief rabbi of Israel, he writes a Mavo, he writes a Hagdama, an introduction to the Sefer, but the Hagdama is about maybe 20 pages. <laughs> I've never seen a Hagdama talking about a rabbi so heartfelt, like Rabbi Shlomo Amar and Rabbi Yosef Mishash. He, it's another level. So just to take a little snippet from this uh, Maboy that Rabbi Amar wrote, he says like this, I'm going to just read the bold. Lo natali bo ahar Rabbi Yosef Mishash, he didn't go after this intellectual acrobatics when it's coming to Torah and Halakha. He didn't go after tons of having tons of Sfarim. Now you read a Teshuvah, they try to bring every Sefer in the world. He would go to the Gemara, to the source, with proper iyun, with proper elucidation, understanding of it, and with proper thought. He loved, he loved to keep things short. He would bring the main Gemara, what the Rishonim said, some of the little snippets of the Achronim. So everything is nice in order. And he would practice the way that the Rishonim used to do. Pretty much the feeling you get from reading this Rav Amar is that he's saying that Rav Yosef Mishash, he was on the world, he was in the thought, he was in the st similar style of the Rishonim, something that you don't find nowadays. He was following the practice of the Rishonim, the same style. If you read a Tishuvot of the Rambam, I'm sure many here, the season Tamidim, they read many Tishuvot of the Rambam. Yeah, sometimes it could be three, four, five lines, one line, some like two lines. Rav Yosef Mishash was the same style. It's not about the... The quantity, it's really the quality of his words. At the same time, people can take his words wrong because since you, you, you he wrote such small uh, uh, amount of words, perhaps sometimes you take it wrong. So you, therefore, you have to treat it with a lot of respect when you're coming to the tissue with the Rebbe Yosef Mishash. You can't just throw it away and dismiss it very easily. Um, he says also, Behem Shalosh, he says, So he says something very interesting. Let's say you take a shoot of Rebbe Mishash, you could have 220 pages of a teshuvah, of a, of a book of, of teshuvot. Ubehem, in, in that sefer, you have shelosh meot asar teshuvot. You can have 314 teshuvot. So you're getting multiple teshuvot on one page, which again, you don't find nowadays. You open up uh, a chamobadi sefer, one teshuvah is minimum three, four, five pages, you know, minimum. He had multiple teshuvot on one page. He says, and, and this, in the ways of the Achronim, this is This is not something that is found at all. Because now, because nowadays, the way, the way of the world is just, it's called the Yeshiva Charade. Bring as many things as you can. We'll skip a little more. He says, this is, this way of bringing this raid of all these different uh, poskim, that's not found in the Rishonim, like we mentioned. That's of the Achronim. But Rabbeinu, lo melaked velo measef. Rabbeinu, he wasn't there to come and summarize different shitot and come and bring this rabbi says this rabbi says that. He's trying to give you the emet, the truth, what he held the halacha is. And his wisdom was that he was able to consolidate it into such small, powerful words. And he says, Rav Shlomo Amar, and Rav Shlomo Amar to many is one of the greatest poskim nowadays for his Fari Jewry. My own rabbi, Rabbi Ben Chaim, he told me that he thinks Rav Shlomo Amar right now is greater than any Sephardi posek. He says, and not everybody can really appreciate and see and understand the greatness of the Teshuvot of Rav Yosef Meshash. Because nowadays, everybody is used to reading long Teshuvot. So this was not with Rav Yosef Meshash. So Rav Yosef, Shlomo Amar says something amazing. I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, give a kitsur of it. He says that Rav Yosef Meshash was writing Teshuvot to all across the world. But he was the one himself that published the Otzer Mikhtavim. He was the one that kept all the Teshuvot. So for every Teshuvah he wrote, he would make a copy of it. He, took, he would write one, send it away, and have the same thing copied for himself. So like that, he can have a Sefer Otzer Mikhtavim. And he said, he just remembered Mar, it's amazing how back then he didn't have computers, he didn't have pictures to take, nothing. Everything, he would copy it twice, keep it organized. And that itself is something to, to, to really praise. Many of the Teshuvot we find, let's say the Rambam, 
we just have to scatter it around. We, we, we go all over the world, found them, and they different rabbinim, put them in different books. But Rabbi Yosef Mishash himself, he would make sure to write everything and make a copy of it and keep it himself. That shows as well that he held, that every teshuvah he wrote was very precious himself and had a lot of depth to it as well. So Rav Moshe Malka, Rav Moshe Malka, uh, Rav Yonatan Alevi as well, he, he talks about him extensively as well. And I, I, I remember he mentioned in one of his shiurim that he's trying to get his farim and that they think the children of the Moshe Malka don't want to, to publish it. And he's trying to, and it's very rare stuff to have. I wish I can find it. The only way I get any of his farim or any of his teshuvot, I see somebody else bring it down. And I ask a guy in Israel who has a computer who has the access to it. And he sends me pictures of Rav Moshe Malka. But Rav Moshe Malka was a gaon olam from Morocco, top dayan, Smicha from all the best rabbinim, tremendous tamir hacham, and he became the rabbi. He made aliyah and he became the rabbi in Petah Tikva in Israel. And he was a big fan of Rav Yosef Meshash. And he writes something nice about the just the skills of Rav Yosef Meshash in writing. He says, That the writing, the, um, the, 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 the Kitav Yad of Rav Yosef Meshash, the calligraphy of Rav Yosef Meshash, it embarrasses any printing press, any printer. It destroys it. And just a picture here. Imagine this is just a, a little a letter he's writing. And if you can see closely how beautiful, you know, just the, this is the Hetzi Kulmus, the way the old Moroccan Ham used to write. This is just his, you know, standard writing on a, on a simple document. This is another level. He was an artist. Siurim as well, talking about art. He says in the Sefer Zehayom, the biography of Batra Mishash, he says, mm-hmm. So Rav Yosef Mishash, he, he drew a lot. And he, in his farim, we're going to see, he has pictures all over the place. And they ask him about it. He says, Why, Rabbi, what's Pshat? Why are you writing all the, why are you drawing these pictures in your books? So he says something beautiful and uh, something that not a lot of hachamim will find, will, uh, you'll find, or it's common nowadays. He says, these drawings that I draw, when I finish my writing a nice teshuvah, when I wrote a nice chidush Torah, when I worked hard in it, in order to relax and kind of enjoy and celebrate and uh, keep my mind, you know, in enjoyment, let's go with that, I, I start drawing. This is from the, the Shashua Migata Torah, from the enjoyment that I get from the Torah. This is something that is incredible, that he would go after he writes a Teshuvah and go decorating with his pen. Kind of like, you know, in, in school, you see kids writing all over their tests and everything. He would do it in a beautiful fashion as a way of celebrating what he just accomplished. And uh, ah, Rav Shlomo Amar, before we get to some pictures of his uh, works, he says uh, an amazing story that Rav Yosef Meshash Rav Shlomo Amar, when he was young, he used to go and do some shimush under Rav Yosef Meshash. And he says a story that when he went to, to the house of Rav, of Rav Meshash in Haifa, we're going to learn about that. He says that Rav, Rav Yosef Meshash told them a story that a bunch of artists came from Haifa and they wanted to see about this artist rabbi, this Tamid Hacham. They wanted to see about him. And they said, He said, oh, sorry. And he says, we, we, the, the artist, group of artists said, we heard that you draw amazing artwork. And we wanted to see it. And Rav Mishash actually showed it to them. And it was around six meters, this artwork. And he put it on a nice table somewhere. And there was glass over it. And... And he says, Rav Amar, he says, I'm trying to just translate outside. He says that Rav, Mish, Rav Amar himself saw many times whenever he would visit the house. And all the artists, these sec, probably secular artists from, from Haifa, they came and they were just shocked to see this work. And they didn't believe that Rav Yosef Mishash himself could draw something like this. Who is this rabbi just like a Moroccan Hacham drawing pictures like this, artwork like this. Uh, and what he did right away, says Rav Mishash, and Rav, Rav, it says Rav Amar asked him, so what did you do? And he says, I took a piece of paper and I started drawing something similar to the artwork. And right away, when they saw that I was drawing it, they knew, okay, wow. From that little piece, you can see in vision that he is able to draw that entire thing. So from then on, they believed him. And he says like this, Ramesh go. he says that the chol farad mi'utarim, all is farim, like we mentioned before, they're filled with artwork, with beautiful art. 
the eye is pleasant to the eye. And he says, the end dugma lehem sfarim. You can't find anything like this in other works of work of, of, of Sfarim. Besides that, besides the Shirim, his songs, he writes songs, the him Miofiatsurim, the way he would decorate them, the him aturim, the duchana mamarim, and of course the stuff inside the, 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 the artwork, which is the words of Rav, Rav uh, Mishash. It all came from him, and it's another level that you can't find in any quality and any other hacham. He says, Ashrei Ainaim Shirau, praiseworthy are the ones that are blessed are the ones that get to see this type of work. So just some pictures of some of his artwork that he did. If you see here, this is, uh, um, I think this is on the Haggadah, that you just see like, okay, besides the Kitav Yad that he's writing the Hebrew, you can see that he was the one that decorated the, if you see the hey, Aleph, all these roses, the, everything was him, his own artwork. Another one he wrote, uh, he drew this beautiful picture. And believe it or not, there is, there's a misura of a lot of Chachamim Moroccans to do it like that. I, there's a famous picture. If you open up the Abu Tainu Sidur of uh, Rabatia that he wrote a, a Sidur from Moroccan Chachamim, they actually have from Rabbi Rafael Amalach Berdugo. Um, I'm not directly related to him, but cousins of a cousin of a cousin. He also has a menorah that he would draw. When he would draw, he drew, and anywhere in Morocco, pretty much anywhere, says Rabbi Atiyah, that you would find this picture of the menorah. So the Hachamim, they were also artists as well. They they, they nurtured art as well. Their their, their way of Torah. Um, in the Maim Kedushim, this is the a new sefer that was published recently. They actually put um, his artwork on the front cover. If you can see, it's here. Stop share. You can see it right here. This is also, this is the kind of put some gold around it, but this is also, this is his artwork that he did. Let's go back to share screen. Okay. Okay, also, so we mentioned a little bit that he also, he was a poem, he was a poet. I think we mentioned that, but he was also a poet. He was, uh, he would write Paitanim, he would write songs, Shirim. He will write them for either for smachot or for if he's giving rebuking to somebody or for, and there's an avel and he wants to, for their anguish, he will write them a, 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 a song. And he says, In his teshuvot, you find them randomly all over, all over the place. He says it's beautiful. And just on the top of my mind, he has on, this just the galut of Abishash. He wrote, a, he was, a, a, of course, a, 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 a Baki in Shehita, and he wrote an entire song to remember the halachot of Shehita. But the way, me, myself, I wasn't raised, and a lot of us, we weren't raised with this old Sephardic culture of, they, they knew psukim, any, you, you start off one, two, three words of a pasuk, they finish it off. It's a different culture that even, I, I, have, I, have, to, I have to have safari opening, open up when I'm doing the Tishwad of Rabbi Shash, because almost every other word is a pasuk or somehow manipulating the pasuk in order to get to this point that he wants to create. So in, in the Hilchot Shechita, he has the entire song that he wrote just so people can remember Shechita, but it's in, in a very poetic, beautiful way. For Hanukkah as well, he has ones on Yom Ma'ut, he wrote a beautiful song. He has all over the place, there's different ones. For things that happened him personally, like this one, this was a story that happened that he fell into a, a, a pit and he, he was carrying a jar of oil and a camel hit him and he almost was going to die. And he wrote a song from, the, from, from this, a, a shir for this, a, a, a piyut. And if you actually see in the, the beginning of every word, of every line, it's, it spells his Rosh uh, Yatevot of his name. Uh, Yosef, Mishash, and then Hazak. Uh, it was a very common thing to end up with Hazak and the Sfardi Paitanim. This is something that the old Sfardi tradition, they would always have Eben Ezra, um, oh, oh, a lot of the great Tamir Hamim Sfaradi Roshonim, they would always write their name into the song. Okay, so back to his uh, biography. In 1939, when he was 47 years old, Rav Moshe Toledano was a Dayan in Meknes. He passed away, and they asked him to come back and be the rabbi there. Could be as well that the many Jews from Algeria were leaving, going to Israel, going to France, the community was dying out. He went back to Morocco and he became, he was one of the Dayanim, Dayanim in Meknes. And as a Dayan, he sat along with Rabbi Yoshua Berdugo, as well as who was the, he became eventually the chief rabbi of Morocco, as well as Rabbi Rafael Baruch Toledano. Right, right, rabbi Rafael Baruch Toledano is the one who wrote the Kisushu Hanaruch Sfaradi. Um, his, his children are all tremendous Samri Chahamim that opened up Yeshivot in in Israel, but a very different approach to Rav Yosef Meshash. Opposite. Here is, is a picture. 
um, of you see Rav Yosef Meshash right here. And this is Rabbi Rafael Baruch Toledano right there. And they were sitting on the same Beit Din. This is actually a beautiful picture. I cut it out, but with all the, a lot of Moroccan hachamim, a very rich person got all the hachamim together and they made certain takanot and certain things together. But this is a picture of both Rabbi Baruch Toledano and Rabbi Meshash. And just uh, from Rabbi Amara as well, I do want to get into some teshuvot and I see time is flying by. Um, but he just talks about how they used to have a lot of machloket between Rabbi Meshash and Rabbi Toledano in the Beit Din. Rabbi Meshash would always be koah de adifa, always being more mekel. That was his, Rabbi Amar says that was his just pinimut, that was his essence. Whereas Rav Toledano was more machmir and he was always saying that if you do this, this takala is going to come from it. And they would go back and forth. It's a very interesting way they used to write it. The, Rav, uh, Rav Meshash says is that the, the Lashon is, he says, this fire in you, that you're so strong and want to be machmir, that's destroying the truth in the halakha. There's a truth that you're, it's, it's being hindered because of your, you know, your, your fire for to being machmir. And then Rabbi, Rabbi Baruch would answer him back, I got this fire from your father. Because Rabbi Baruch was a little older than Rabbi Yosef Meshash. And he says that, I got this, I learned this from your father. He didn't, I think he was two years older too. So he got a little more shemush from his father. But again, in, in, in where they were living, Mekdes, there was only, you were exposed and you absorbed many different uh, shitot and different styles from all different hachamim of Mekdes. Uh, my brother, Rabbi Yoshua Berdugo, was working on translating some books from a uh, certain hachamim back then. You know, they, they, they were also very open into Rishonim that nowadays nobody would talk about. The Radbad, the Radak, the Radak, you know, Rabbi Berdugo was so into Radak. It's something you don't find nowadays. Um, okay, in 1963, he went to Eretz Israel, and uh, there for he was there for four years without any position, and he didn't want he would he never looked for a position. From then on, from from 1967, a lot of pressure. There was even secular people were pressuring. They all had a every time they met they met Rabbi Yosef Mishash, they would fall in love with him. He had a certain hen that everybody loved, and he became the chief rabbi of Haifa. He took over from Rabbi Nisim Ohana, who passed away. Um, another interesting fact that a lot of people don't know is that he was asked to be the Rishon Litzion, the chief rabbi of Eretz Israel. After Rabbi Uziel, Rabbi Ben Sion, Hai Uziel, Meir Uziel, he passed away. They asked him, Rabbi David Shelush. Rabbi David Shelush is actually one of uh, the Rabbanim that should be part of this Habura as well, that we should work on as well. He is a tremendous Tamir Hacham. Uh, and he actually asked, he pressured, he said, please, to, uh, he is working on Rabbi Yosef Meshash to make him to be the chief rabbi. But to Rabbi Yosef Meshash, he said he doesn't look for any position. He doesn't want any serara. He doesn't want any authority. And he only did any, any position he ever took was because it was, a, it was a, it had to be done for whatever reason. And he didn't feel like he needed to be, to be done in Eretz Yisrael. And he let other people take the position. This is not something you would find nowadays. You know, <laughs> automatically when you become chief rabbi, I think you have a salary of maybe two hundred thousand dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. All the kavod in the world, people are everybody's going and trying to you know to 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 get and be voted into that job. But Rabbi Shash, Rabbi Yosef Meshash, you see, is uh, an avut, how humble he was, and he he declined it. He said, "No, I'm sorry." And then he writes in the same teshuva, a beautiful teshuva. He just goes through his entire life and. Uh, they also, they asked for a picture of the rabbi because Rabbi Herzog wanted to know more about him and the biography. So he writes the biography. He tells them where to look for a picture of him as well in his farim. and But he says he declines the job anyways. Um, yeah, so this is from Rav Toledano. Rav Shlomo Toledano, also an amazing rabbi. He wrote a sefer uh, arguing on Rav Yitzhak Yosef because Rav Yitzhak, the, the, Yosef, the, the Yosef family, they argue, they always go against the Moroccan Minhagim a lot. With Temani, and they like to bother Moroccans as well. So Rav Shlomo Toledano, he he, he wrote the sefer, a few sfarim, and he also was a big Talmud and a big fan of Rav Shlomo Toledano of uh, Rav Yosef Meshash. And he writes there that something very interesting. He says, "Who shall let be historia gam shel am Yisrael gam shel umot haolam?" He knew history of Goyish history of non-Jewish history. He knew about Jewish history. I, I, I was reading recently, and they, they asked him about. Spain. When did the Jews get to Spain? Why is the name called Sfarad? Why is it called Spain? Any type of thing you want to know, he was a historian as well. 
Jewish and not Jewish alike. When Napoleon came and took over, what happened there? When the French took over here, what happened? Anything you want to know, he was a, a, a Bucky in it. And then something very interesting why I think uh, all the Talmudim uh, of this Habura are going to love, it says Rav Meshash, sorry, sorry, Rav Toledano, it says, Hu haya ben habodedim b'meknes, b'meknes, sorry, the Nikudot were wrong, I just plugged into the computer. Shenatan shi'ur b'more nebuchim b'kibutza sodit. He was one of the few Rabbanim, I don't know who other, which other rabbi would do it, but that he gave a secret shi'ur of more nebuchim in Meknes. And remember, we're talking about Meknes is, you know, we're in the world, already Sephardi Judaism within that time had a lot of hashba from Kabbalah. Um, more nebuchim was very looked down upon by, by the by the Mikubalim for sure. The hashkafa is uh, came out to different religion, but he's quietly, secretly would give a shi'ur on more nebuchim. Okay, so now some politics. This is a picture in uh, in uh, a sefer of Otsam Mikhtavim. They have a picture of him with Rabbi Ovadi Yosef. Well, actually, Rabbi Meshash went and visited him in the house when Rav uh, Ovadi was a chief rabbi. And Rav Ovadia gives a blow, a big blow to Rabbi uh, in the stomach to Rabbi uh, Yosef Meshash. Talking about a certain technicality about uh, ta'aruvot, about mixtures, forbidden mixtures, he says, he, ta- he says, sorry, to go back a little bit, that Rav Yosef Meshash brought in the name of a certain rabbi that why Rabbi Maman, why it's okay that, that this was the, the minhag and this is how we protect the halacha. And so says Rabbi Vadi on this Shemua that he heard from Rabbi Meshash. He says, He says something like this. He says, even though in general, we do not follow the halachot or the psakim of Rabbi Yosef Meshash, nevertheless, he says, he is, he's okay for Eidut. If he, Rabbi Meshash is going to say, oh, in Morocco, this was the minhag, or the women used to check the uh, na'na leaves like this, we can be somech on him. We can, he's a, for a dude, he's okay. Right, and since he's saying that uh, Rav Maman, Gaon, he said this, we can be somech on him. But for his halachot, we can't be somech on him. So imagine, Rav, already just in the, the world of politics, in the Olam Yeshivot, they don't, they're not somech on Rav Ovadia. He's the two mekel. You know, you have, you have the Mishnah Birurat Dirshu, they don't even quote Rav Ovadia. Maybe one time they quote Yakut Yosef. They don't quote him at all because he's to Mekel or whatever his hashkafa was. And then not only that, now you have Rav Ovadia, who the Olam Yeshua doesn't quote. He's saying, we can't be so mechan Rav Yosef Meshash, just to give you an idea of what's going on. So now you have Rabbi Moshe Malka. We talked about him before. Rabbi Moshe Malka, again, we said he was a tremendous Tamir uh, He wrote many different Shuvot. Mikvat uh, I would love to get a copy on that, Rabbi Levi. If you ever get a copy, please let me know how I can get a copy. I think you mentioned you did get a copy. You have also, he has Veshev Moshe, and there he talks about Rav Meshash. They asked him, what, what was your take on Rav Yosef Meshash? So he says something like this. He says, Kavod Torato, Shoel Haim Rabbeinu Morocco, Kiblu et Dato. You asked, whoever was asking Rabbi Malka, did, did they accept in Morocco Rabbi Meshash? And he says, Bivadai lo kulam. For sure, not everybody accepted Rabbi Yosef Meshash. Eleha ma'adifim kohad hetira heritsu oto. Only the people that loved that koah, the, the more linked approach is the more proper approach. They loved him and he was a gadol ador for them. Everything he wrote was holy in their eyes. They took it very seriously. However, however, those people that they want to be extra pious and they love to be mahmir, which there is a shita that you find amongst that, especially the Sfari Mekubalim and the poskim that go with that approach. They hold every generation has to be more and more mahmir. The, the shit of the Benish Shai, the Chida brings on as well. These people that love the Humrot, lo nahagu kimoto, they didn't follow Rav Meshash at all. Vekachi hamida bechol dor. And this is the same thing that happens every single generation. You have the Rabbanim that are more mekel, the Kohad de Hatir Adifa, and you have the Rabbis that like to be more mahmir. And it's something that happens every generation. History repeats itself. So now, in regards to something like, for example, Rav, Rav Ovadi Yosef said about Rav Meshash, as well as I couldn't find the inside, but uh, the Ish Matzliah, the father of Rabbi Meir Mazuz as well, says something very strong about uh, against Rabbi Meshash as well. He says, Harav HaGaon, this is Rabbi Malka, Kevon Moreno Rabbeinu Rabbi Yosef Meshash, who posek gadol musmach mechubad. He is a tremendous posek, and you can hold of him, and he's is highly esteemed. Umi shehigil lecha shen somechina devarav, and somebody who tells you that you, don't, you can't rely on his works, 
listen how strong. Sheker Diber, he speaks lies. And eventually he's going to receive punishment for that, for saying these things against Rav Yosef Mishash. So it sounds like this was uh, getting back at uh, Rav Ovadi Yosef and other Rabbanim as well. So now going to his Hashkafa, um, Yom Atzma'ut, very interesting, um, his approach. Somebody asked him, what, what's the Sfaradi approach? What's our approach to Yom Atzma'ut? He says, Teshuvah. Don't be busy with these things pretty much with what the Ashkenazim say. Because I, I miss it up with the Ashkenazim, they would say tahanun, silihot, on Yom Atzmaut. They, they would make it like a day of mourning. He says, don't be busy with these things. Don't get yourself occupied with this. You are a God-fearing Sephardic Jew. Do what we do. We do it with, yom, with a halal gamor, complete halal. Probably with the Beracha. The Hoda'a, even his cousin, Rav Shalom, we didn't mention Rav Shalom, Meshash, his cousin was a little more Haredi, let's say, approach of the Hashkafadat, but he would even also would say with the Beracha. Bahalel Gamor, the Hoda'a, the Melech Hakabot Baruchu, and we thank Hashem on this day. The Ochlim, the we eat and we drink and we're happy. And we don't care what all the other Ashkenazi want to do. <laughs> we, this is how our approach is, and follow this approach. So now this is also interesting. Rav Mishash, some little background history, he had some letters with some Rabbanim from Satmer. Uh, most notable, Rav Yosef Shimon Falk. Falk. Rav Falk, he was in charge of the Beit Vad Lechamim, which was a, 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 a Yerchon, a, a, a subscription of a, a magazine, or whatever they called it back then, of different Likutim, a different Torah that Satmer used to put out, of collecting different Hamim and putting out and sending out to everybody. So I went through some of the different Tishuot of Rav Mishash. It's funny, in the beginning, he signs up for, he subscribes to it. He pays, he says to the rabbi folk, you know, he's giving him so much respect and your gaon olam, da, da, da. Subscribe me to the Satmir newsletter, to the Mishmacha magazine, whatever you call it. And he actually gives, he sends him for half of a year of subscription. He tells him. Then, eventually, he gets the subscription. And on one of them, he reads that they're just bashing and destroying Rabbi Cook. Rav Cook, the chief rabbi of, of, uh, of Israel at that time, of Palestine at that time. And they're bashing him, destroying him, saying all these motzah shemra against him. So he was shocked. And he didn't know if it was true or not. So Rav Yosef Mishash, he's a truth seeker. He went and sent letters to, rabbi Cook, to Rav Cook. He sent many letters to Rav Cook, multiple letters. And Rav Cook actually, he first he says, is this true? Did you do this? Did you do that? Rav Cook replies back to him privately. Tells him that's not true. Da, da, da. He sends all his farim to Rav Mishash as well. And Rav Mishash falls in love with his farim with Rav Kook. And he praises him like crazy. And then he writes back to Rabbi uh, Falk. And he gives this lashon. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll skip it. But he writes and how poetic he is beautifully. You know, he says that he, he calls him B'nai Korach. And that you guys are, you're shaving. Not only you're bald, but you shave your beard with lashon ara, with the knife of lashon ara. And... You guys are dressing up like pure Haredim, but you guys don't have any derech eretz, <laughs> and uh, and you're not uh, and and the derech eretz that come in Torah in a You guys don't love derech eretz, which comes before Torah. Ki tovat tochat b'shuva benachad. You should have given tochacha in a nice way. Why do you have to embarrass Rav Cook in that type of way? So Rav, Rav Mishash wasn't scared of anybody, and he gave it to them. Okay, so now we get into a couple of teshuvot. I don't know if we have time. I think that's it. No, maybe we'll save it for another time. Uh, honestly, I think we could be here for the next five hours. So as long as the Rav is okay, yeah, okay please, yeah. Uh, yeah, please continue. Yeah, okay, no problem. Anybody who wants to go, no problem. So we'll go. We'll take a couple of teshuvot that he talked about um, just to understand the hashkafa and get appreciation for him. So L'shem Yehud, somebody asked him. He went to Meknes to the city, and he saw that everybody there is saying L'shem Yehud for every mitzvah they do. Before any mitzvah, they're saying L'shem Yehud, L'shem Yehud. So this rabbi asked him, what, what's the deal with this L'shem Yehud? So he says, Rabbi Mishash, yamim Yeah, me too. I also started looking into this thing. I wanted to see who can explain to me this L'shem Yehud. Because he really didn't understand it himself. I couldn't find it. He says, because anyway, this thing came from the Mekubalim. This is beautiful, what he says. 
הנה, קל וחומר for nowadays, is, ובזמן הזה תמה ונשלמה חוכמת הקבלה מערי המערב. Nowadays, he's saying in North Africa, there is no more people who know Kabbalah. It's gone. ותחתיה עמדה קבלה חדשה אצל בעלי הדמיון. The only Kabbalah we have nowadays is the Kabbalah of, it's called the בעלי דמיון, the people with imagination. They make things, this is this, and this represents this, and that. He says, already in Morocco, every, you know, you go to any Shabbat table, people are, they're talking Kabbalah, this is the Kabbalah, בעלי דמיון, all their imagination. מלאה על כל גדולה, it's filled to the top, it's, uh, it's everywhere. רק חלופי אותיות וגמטריות, all they talk about is, oh, we can swap this letter with this one, or this, rep- this, number, this word represents this number, גמטריה, and this represents this, and this is the דברי תורה that they're going with. They didn't have depth to the Kabbalah. וסודות מעולפים בדברי הוויה אשר בדו מלבם ריקח המוח, and it's filled with emptiness for these empty people. ולמען תתעלל במת השקל, he says, the reason why they were doing this because He says they had ill intent that with this crazy Kabbalah, since nobody understands it anyways, they would get a lot of kabod for such a beautiful pshat. וסודות מעולפים דרי הווי אשר בדו מלבם ריקי הממוה, אה, סליחה, אני סודה. למדו לשונם איזה קטעים מדברי בעלי סודות ראשון מן הנכונים. They would learn a few pieces from the early מקובלים, and then they would use it for their ill poison. ויחזו, אוקיי, ברינס פיסוקים. And he says, well, I skip to the next, I, I cut out a little segment from the Teshuvah. And he says, I, Again, he's a truth seeker. I wanted to find out what to do. So I, call, I started asking people here in Meknes. Since sometimes you can find one gem amongst everything, so too maybe there's going to find one rabbi who knows what he's talking about. And that's going to, you know, let me go and, and be okay with the L'Shem Yechud, which is our minhag. He says, He said, when I started asking them, each rabbi, each chacham gave me a different perush. He says, any ishemet, any truthful person, would be, he would be embarrassed to say the pshatim that they were saying about the L'Shem Yechud. He says, there's in these words, these perushim, mamash kifira. It's like you're being a kofir, going against the Torah, the, the fundamentals of Torah. He says, mechuseh b'saif dak. However, it's covered with a very thin layer that you don't see it, but you have to, if you can open up the layer, this little covering, you'll see it's kubi kifira. Asher lo hevinu mehamad pitayutam. And they don't understand this because they're so dumb, <laughs> these people. They're not very educated. And that's why they think it's okay to say this, these pshatim. And when I would ask, um, I would ask, which sefer did you find these pshatim? They would say, oh, it's in many sfarim. Oh, it's in, it's brought in the sfarim. However, nobody would tell me where it is. He said, so then I knew that other words are heaven. So, and then he just to take it a little further. He says, even more than this, what would make him even more crazy is that they would say in the Leshem Yehud, that we are going to be so much, we're going to rely on all the kavanot of the Arizal so that he can fix us in the Shurashim Mekom Elyon in the high places. So he says, How could you even say this? How can you, how is it, can, how can you be so much when you're saying tefillah and you're going to pray and you're going to say the Shem Yechud and that you want to have the kavanot of the Arizal? He says, How can you have this concept of being so much? You're relying or, or attaching your kavanot to his kavanot, so therefore his kavanot will be your kavanot. He says, Everybody does their own tefillah. He said, a question mark, does everybody really go into their tefillah very deep? Everybody's doing their own things, their stupidities, they don't have bad kavanah when they're davening, when they're praying. The kavanot tarizal ha'chai kadosh she'ala ila elokim mezeh me'ot b'shanim in Rav Arizal, he had great kavanot from hundreds of years ago. That's going to cover up the Averot of the people that are praying if they have bad Kavanot. Is there any more thing that's crazy and stupid than this? He says, and he says, He's saying, imagine we, we always are bashing and we're astonished by the Umot, which is pretty much referring to Christians, the Nevi'im Yichaper, that they say, oh, this Prophet will uh, will atone for us. 
I'm Ham Anon that we, the wise nation, Hoshuim Kemachshavot Halila, that we think similarly, that we can say, oh, the Arizal is going to be fixing our Kavanot. So he said, just to end off this Teshuvah, he says, Right, uh, any Moroccan Jews, they know before, after they do Netirat Adayim, they sing a whole song before they say Hamotzi. So, so I, I don't maybe understand that song, but I say it anyways. He says, we all have the minak to do it, especially Moroccans. He says, even though I don't know a proper reason for it, uh, sorry, uh, oh, he says, Hatam Shani, uh, the Afshainli Ba Muvan, Hatam Shani, oh, sorry, Hatam Shani, there it's different. That song is different. Because since there's a nice song we sing with it, I'm going to continue to say it. And since there's a nice song, that covers off, that covers up the lack of understanding. So since it's a nice song, you know, it's a, this is how Sfari I'm going to sing the song even though I don't understand it. But when you're saying L'Shem Yichud, we don't sing a nice song with that. It's all about the intention of L'Shem Yichud. I'm going to stop that. I'm not going to say it because we have no understanding behind it. Uh, I can go on forever. We have maybe four or five little snippets of Teshuvot. A couple more minutes? It's okay? Yeah? Okay. So it says Kaparot. Kaparot. As we know, most uh, Sephardi Jews, they're very big into Kaparot. And he says like this, an another little snippet. He says, Vim kein me'achar de maran, de shuchan aruch. As people, some people don't know, but he actually was against the custom of doing Kaparot. That Chadidie Samhin, and we rely on his, on his Torah. Vegam hayalo yad v'shem gadol b'kabalai. And Rav, Rav, Rav Maran Bet Yosef, he also knew Kabbalah as well. He was living the same as the Arizal and Moshe Cordova. He knew many Mikubalim. So he knew the Kabbalah as well. This is very interesting. Even the Rambam, especially the Rambam, he knows more Kabbalah than Arizal. I don't think you'll ever find any Mikubal that says that the, that the Rambam's Kabbalah is more, is a, or he, he himself knew more knowledge than the Arizal and Kabbalah. Upasku and all his Rabbanim, Maran Bid Yosef, the Ramban, they all say, Sheyesh Beze Hashash Yisur Torah. They say that there's a Torah in it, and they say you have to stop it. We for sure have to follow them. And whoever goes and stops it, that's an amazing thing. You have a big beracha. So that's kapara. Now the Zohar, very interesting. Safari Rabbanim, you, you always hear Ashkenazi Rabbanim, but especially in Morocco, talking about the Zohar and kind of being misupak about the authenticity uh, the authenticity of the Zohar and this, where it came from, I don't know anybody in Morocco that would talk like this. And Rabbi Meshash himself, he, he was asked a question, because people historically, they asked him, again, like we said before, what, why is this sefer called this? Or why is this called that? He said, why is it called a Zohar HaKadosh? Why do we attach the name HaKadosh to it? So he says, first of all, he says, the Zohar itself, he says, Rabu Hadeot. Ad Kihar Beh Halitu Shamikubar Mari. He says that maybe perhaps it was Ramoshe Cordevero who wrote it. And he was Nitla Ilan Gadol. And he said, Oh, you know who he attached it? He said he wanted people to know the sefer. So he said it's the Rashbi. It was Rabbi Shuma Bayuchai because the Rashbi, as we know, he was for 13 years in the cave. And he says that I saw that the Rashbats. The Ya'ab, sorry, Michila, the Ya'abetz Ashkenazi. Ya'abetz Ashkenazi, he has to write the Ya'abetz Ashkenazi. People know Ya'abetz is Rabbi ya Yaakov Emden. However, in Morocco, you had Rabbi Yaakov Ibn Sur, which was the Ya'abetz of Morocco, which is an amazing rabbi as well. Um, he, ha he was the Moroccan version, so that's why he had to write the Ya'abetz Ashkenazi, the German one, the Ashkenazi one. He also talked about it and, and said that, you know, perhaps it's not so authentic and we don't know who it was and who wrote it. And on, at the same time, even if it was Rabbi Shuma Bayuchai, a lot of pages were altered, and we don't know exactly which pages uh, the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote. So he says, anyways, how did he get the name? So he just gives out the Hagdama, and he says, how did he get the name Zohar HaKadosh? Why is it called Kadosh? So he says, at first, in the beginning, it was just called Midrash Rashbi. That's what it was called. Just like you have Pirkei de Rebbe you had Midrash Rashbi. However, But in order, the Mikuwalim, they came with the plane. He said, in order to make it more precious in the eyes of the people, they change the name to Sefer Zohar. They change it to Zohar. That's what it's going to be called. Like it says in the Pasuk, Zohar is the light from the, from the, from the skies. And then, 
And other people later came and they gave it a different name. It says, they gave it another, sorry, they added to the name, Zor HaKadosh. Why do they call that Kadosh? Lo haval hava, hibal hiba, to make it more precious. Like we said, the Shlach HaKadosh or Or Haim HaKadosh. And to make it more appeasing to the people and more respectful to the people so that people will read it and, uh, and buy it or both read it and buy it as well. And he says, uh, but here are for Tanakh and Shas and Midrash, other things, we don't need that because it's already, he says, everybody already appreciates these works as well. So this is a very interesting take on a Sephardi rabbi to say this openly in a Sefer of Otsa Mikhtavim about the Zohar. I, mean, I don't know other ones, especially in Morocco, uh, where there was a heavy influence of Kabbalah, maybe in the Spanish Portuguese community is very different, but that is uh, very fascinating. Um, the Koach HaPsak, just a, 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 to show he wasn't scared. Most now, most post game nowadays, you read a Sephardi uh, Sefer, everything is Maran, Maran, Maran. We can't be Cholig with Maran. So if Maran brings something in the Beit Yosef, you can't go left or right to Maran. Um, but here they ask him about the Minhag of covering the knife during Birkat Amazon. There's a, I don't know if people have the Minhag here, but many people, they cover it during Birkat Amazon. Maran says in Shulchan he says, you don't have to do it during Yamim Tovim and Shabbatot, but during the weekday, they would cover it. And there's, he brings different reasons as well. We're not going to go into it because time is short. And he says in the end, he says, he says, uh, oh, next page. He says, going towards the end, he asked whoever asked him, he says, here you have, I brought you all the sources. I laid it out for you. Here's everything about it. If you want to be particular about it, no problem. And somebody who doesn't want to be particular about this halakha or this minhag, even though Shulchan Aruch, he brings it down as well. We don't grab him or go against him because of this. This is just some nice carefulness type of thing. Like the achronim that we brought above. Only he could say this. And all these rishonim that they give these reasonings, in bahem mamash, there's no toch to it. There's no real reason behind it, and not something that's um, sophisticated or or meaningful enough that you would that would require you to change your hanhaga, the way you're going. Veshelom Yisrael. So that's just uh, another approach that you know. Yeah, people say it from the rishonim, but he wasn't fearful to even go against anybody or to say words like that. That in bahem mamash. You know, if you show that. Uh, some uh, in the Shiva Sephardi rabbi that talk, they're going to say, how could you say that against the Rabbanim? He didn't care. Melam Zechut, Rabbi Meir Abitbol, who is the owner of the Sifri Sfarim, now it's in Barilan Street. He just writes how Rabbi Meshash, a big force behind him was Melam Zechut. He wanted to make sure that unlike Ashkenazi Judaism, the Horban that happened in them, that over 90% of them went off the derech completely and became, you have reform, conservative, whatever, every couple of months, a different, a different one. He didn't want this to happen to Sephardi Judaism. And he didn't want anybody to feel like a rasha bifne atzmo. He went and made sure that, listen, the halacha is sweet. It's not so hard. And therefore, he went very far to find certain heterim to people. And he was so mech on certain kulot ba'alacha in order so that the people, these people don't kick the Torah. And they're not going to follow the Torah. And if they kick the Torah, they're not going to have any nachala in it at all. So therefore, he was very forceful and very, he always pushed to find many kulot for people. Even in his Tam Teshuvot, you have to be, it's, it's very, again, Rav Yosef Meshash is a multifaceted personality where he would write certain Teshuvot. People would ask him about how did he was matir that Teshuvah. And later on, he would tell them that I wrote this Teshuvot for, for people that wouldn't do otherwise. And that's why we have to be mekel. So he would go, even though, okay, it, doesn't, it goes against the Shuchan Aruch, it doesn't matter. We have to be Mekel with them because we want to keep them part of Am Yisrael and we don't want them Hasvesham to leave Am Yisrael. And since it's anyways in the Olam Torah that these Shitot are in, you can find them and there's a basis for them, there's a basis for them, we're going to find these things. Right, for example, Kiswe Rosh the Ish. Somebody asked him, a Yemeni rabbi came to, to Algiers and he saw no Jews there were wearing kippot at all. So Rabbi Mishash, and he, in this Tamani rabbi, I say, how can you do that? It's a sword, you have to wear a kippah. So, so probably the most extensive teshuvah on wearing kippot, Rav Mishash, Rav Mishash, it's like five, six, seven pages in Otsar Mikhtabim. He writes, oh, sorry, in Maim Chaim. He writes why, Mikar you don't have to wear a kippah. And even he goes so far that even when you're praying, it's just a midat hasidut to even wear a kippah. 
he shows that it's not, there's no reason. He does say at the end that it's a good thing to wear kippah to so, so other people know that you're religious and that's what we kind of need to know that we're religious, who's religious, and everybody will be religious. But he's showing, again, he wanted to show and defend his community, his people, that they're still part of the ulama Torah even though they're not wearing kippot. Um, another quick uh, teshuvah that he talks about, about going to the Dukhan, the Kohanim, they're supposed to, it's a takana, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai, that you have to take off your shoes before you go up to do the Dukhan, to go to do Birkat Kohanim. Already as he, in his time, people didn't want to take off their shoes. For, he brings out multiple reasons. So he goes and finds, he brings the different shitot of why, what was the reason behind the takana? And he explains why nowadays we don't have to do it. And he gives them a zakhut for these people that they don't take off their shoes. And he allows it. And he's not the first one to do it, but he extensively wrote about it. And he goes here, he, expand, he extends. This is something that uh, we have to have another habura about, about his concept of batel tam, batel gezera. This was a takana, a decree from Yohanan ben Zakai. And he gave a reason for the takana. The Gemara gives a reason. The Mifarshim tried to explain the reason behind it. There's Amoraim also debate about the reason behind it, but there is a reason behind it. And Rav Mishash said, he lists all the different reasons. And he says that these reasons don't apply nowadays. One of the reasons was because maybe you have to take off your shoes because perhaps you're going to have dirt on your shoes and people are going to look at your shoes. Rav Mishash says nowadays, the, because of the, the, he says the authorities of the, of the, of the government, they clean the streets. Nobody has shoes on top of their, nobody has dirt on top of their shoes at all. And even if you want to say they have dirt on top of their shoes, then it looks disgusting. Nobody nowadays pays attention to that because anyways, people are dochen on the, on the same time. And he says, halavai, that people would pray, pay attention to Birkat Kohanim, people are dozing off. So there's no problem with that. Number two, there's another reason that the Gemara brings down because maybe the ritzuot, the knots of your shoes, the, the, late, the, the strings of your shoes are going to get undone. Then you're going to have to tie them up and you're not going to do Birkat Kohanim and people are going to think that you're Ben Girusha. And you're, you're, you're not really a Kohen, you're a Halal. So he says, nowadays also, our shoes, before you used to wear, they used to wear sandals. And the sandals, if it ripped a little bit, then it came undone, the whole shoe would fall off. He says, nowadays, our shoelaces, they get undone, no big deal, that's not a problem. So he goes on with this whole concept of Batel Tam, Batel Gezera. We don't, there's no reason behind this anywhere and anymore. Sorry, the reason doesn't apply anymore. So therefore, we don't have to continue to promote this or enact this or maintain these Halachot. Of course, he does hold that it's better to do it, but it's a melamed zechut showing that that's okay. It's okay for these people that don't take off their shoes. There's many responses that he talks about, but Tatam, but famously about uh, Eruv. Do you need an Eruv nowadays? Shlomo Amelech, he was gozer. We have to have an Eruv because people are going to get confused with the Rishut Rabim. The question is, Rabbi Shash held that there's no Rishut Rabim nowadays, so therefore maybe there's no reason for an Eruv nowadays. So that's a very fascinating teshuvah. Big machlokot between him and Rabbi Baruch Toledano, back and forth in different teshuvot. That'd be a fun study to do one time. And trying to get the essence of what does it mean, batel tam, batel gezera. He tries to show that even though the Ramam's posek, that even it's batel tam, if the reason doesn't apply, we still have to do it. He says that if the tam doesn't apply and it will never apply again, even in the future, because we know the reason behind it, then the, even the Ramam would agree that the gezera is batel. And he brings down that even the Beit Yosef holds like this because we know the Shulchan Aruch is posek. Sorry, the Gemara is posek. It's a takana based off Tosafot that you're not allowed to leave liquids exposed because perhaps snakes and other animals are going to put venom inside of it. And therefore, anything that's exposed for a certain amount of time, you have to throw it out. Shulchan Aruch says nowadays, based off Tosafot, we don't have to be careful with this. So Rabbi Shash's main theory and main reasoning behind many of these things about Tatam, about Gezah is because if in a case where Maran said you don't have to do it in the case of Sakana. Sakana is a danger. And Sakana is yoter hamur me halacha. For example, may machronim, even if the soldiers were going out to war, they still have to do may machronim, but they wouldn't have to do may rishonim. They don't have to wash before they eat the bread. But may machronim, because of, of uh, Melech Sidomit, the salt that could blind somebody's eyes, has Okay, that's an interesting thing. Uh, Rabbein, Rabbein Avram ben Arama has a beautiful shot about that. They were machmir about it. We have to be machmir about it. So you see, Sakana, danger, things of danger, are more, uh, are, are we have to be more makpid on than things of, of halakha. So he says, if that's the case, then kalva homer for all these things. So he holds that even Maran himself holds a batatam, bat gezera. This is the sheet of the Rosh, Rabbi as well. Rabbi Yosef also holds like this as well. It's an interesting study as well. Um, just we'll end off with this. This is a very fascinating teshuvah about 
a, a girl, a lady who wants to convert or converting a lady, a Nutrit, a Catholic lady, a Christian lady, who's married to a Kohen legally, married legally to a Kohen. We all know a Giorit is a Su, is forbidden to marry a Kohen. A Kohen is forbidden to marry a Giorit. So Rab Mishash, he was asked by Rab Ankawa, he was talking about with Rab Ankawa, the chief rabbi in Morocco, and here he goes and he gives his reason why we have to permit it. And just a few reasons, we'll just end off with this. He says, he says, the Shehu, this is, again, this is Rab Mishash, really getting into the understanding of human complexity and what's going on in the modern times and why we have to kind of bend the halakha for the greater good. He says, Since this girl, this lady, this notrit, is married secularly to this Jew, and nowadays the rabbis, they're powerless. In the time of the Rishonim, even in the Oli Achronim, for sure in the time of the Gemara, the rabbis could put people in prison, the rabbis can hurt people, they can, they, the Beit Din had koach, but nowadays the rabbis are, kemat, they have zero power. They just have the power of talking in speech. So we don't have that power. And this man himself, who's married to this Nosrit, to the, the Christian lady, it's impossible for him to, to divorce. Hen mitzad for multiple reasons. Number one, he says nowadays, love, you know, all the songs, everybody's so into love. Love is very strong nowadays. The love is too strong between these people. You tell them you can't, you can't, you have to get divorced. They're not going to listen. Hen mitzad also, wherever the situation was, divorcing in that time, it wasn't like nowadays you can get divorced overnight. But in the old days, getting divorced, it was a nimshachin shani rabot. It was a long lasting process. But even nowadays, if you get divorced very easily, there's so many consequences. Lo alenu, as Hashem should ever come to us, that you know it can last in monetary wise and, and destroy a family and destroy people. So he said there it would take five, six years, and it's a lot of money. He says, And also, if he gets divorced and he has to, it's a five, six year process, he can't sit by himself. And uh, all his expenses, the money, it's going to eat him up. And on top of it, because she's a Christian girl, they're going to, and they're living in a Christian government, they're going to, they're going to harm him even more, not harm him, but they're going to put pressure on him or really try to destroy him even more. To really wear, wear him out until he's gone. So all these multiple reasons, he's not going to convert, even if the rabbis really beg him to convert. So now, this is Rabbi Yosef Mishash telling the chief rabbi in Morocco, So that this person, he's not going to get divorced and then be by himself. And has Shalom, he can do Isurim of Nida, Shifcha, Goya, Eshet Ish, all these terrible things. And this children of this, of this, of this, the convert, uh, the, or the potential of the, the, the Christian girl with this man, if you don't, if you don't convert them, they're going to think they're Jewish because their father is Jewish. This is something that Rabbi Shash Sarazi's Tishubotam Convergence is very scared of. That people, that their father's Jewish, especially back then, they knew, they thought they were Jewish, 100%. He says, <coughs> I said to myself, we should convert her. We have to convert this girl who even though she's forbidden to, to Kohen. zona, And we're going to only be over. We're going to transgress a safek zona. Why is it a safek? He says, nowadays, anyways, any Kohen, we don't really know if they're a Kohen. We don't have Kohanim Yuhasim nowadays. It's another this topic. Some say we do have Kohanim Muqsekim from the Torah de Oraita, just not Miyuchas, which is an extra level. But he was saying, Rabbi Mishash held, that every Kohen nowadays is a Safek Kohen. And therefore, it's better that we let them marry in, 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 as in, instead of being over on all the other Isurim. And then on top of it, and his Zaro, Afki Yitalel, it's true, his children, they're not going to be proper Kohanim. Doesn't matter. It's not going to be a problem, a stumbling block to the Jewish people because Jewish people are allowed to, regular Jewish men, or they're allowed to marry uh, uh, halalim, people that are not Kohanim, vice versa, for women as well, they can marry, of course, a halal. Oh, sorry, there's a mistake in the way I wrote it here, but he's saying in essence that when you're married to Goya, 
he's going to be embarrassed about his Judaism because she's a uh, street and she doesn't want any Judaism in the house. So therefore now he's empty from all the mitzvot. He's embarrassed about his religion. Okay, so then he says, but once she converts, then she's going to be a little okay with the mitzvot and he's going to have some mitzvot. And he says, and he says, the Avsha Giroti Ali Ahrim. And even though now who's going to be converting her? Other people. The Bed Din is going to convert her. And the Kaimalan. And there's a famous halacha. We don't tell a person, do a sin so that your friend will be okay. That's the concept. You can't do an avira so your friend will benefit, will be better off in a better situation. And be Zakeh will be merited by that. Like it's a Gemara in Shabbat. He says, Hachashani. Here it's different. Mishum mitzvot Here we have a mitzvah of procreation because he's not going to get, he's not going to have the children of, he's not going to do the mitzvah Piriyar Riviyah. And Piriyar Riviyah is in a very important mitzvah. So therefore, let them get married and have children. Otherwise, he'll just have goyot and he'll never get the mitzvah Piriyar Riviyah. His children will be goyim. Umishum mitzvah de rabim. Also, it's a mitzvah de rabim. Why? Why is it a mitzvah for multiple people? Because now, like he said before, if the kids are going to think they're Jewish and they're not Jewish, they're going to mix up with Jewish people. And that's a, a stumbling block for the rabim. And he says, I have a lot to talk about this. He says, there's a mistake here. He says, I didn't come here to be posek alacha because he's writing, imagine, to the chief rabbi. I'm just like a student that's just reminding his Talmud about the different reasons that we have to take into consideration. And you have the choice to do whatever you want, Rav Rashi of Morocco. And you do whatever you want, whatever you desire. So you see again that Rav Meshash, he was thinking of the bigger picture. And even though he's bending the halacha in things that we're not supposed to do, he wanted to make sure that the Jewish people stay united as a Jewish people under the halacha. Hazagobaruch Hashem will be able to... Uh, learn more teshuvot about him. And again, this is just the tipa, the tipa, the tipa, the tipa, who Rav Meshash was. Uh, but uh, looking forward to the addition. Rav, uh, you should see the comments I'm getting in my the WhatsApp saying yeah. how much everybody has enjoyed it uh, so, so much. Uh, I mean, it's 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 one thing to learn about the hacham, but to learn about it in that way, um, it's unique. We went through the history, went through the teachers, went through the context in Morocco, we went through the politics, and then we went through the actual halakhic detail. So uh, an incredible, incredible shiur. Thank you so, so much for that. And we can't wait to have you during yeah. membership mode to analyze the Teshubot uh, uh, with us. So um, uh, you're stuck with us now. We're, we're going to yeah, be, uh, yeah. be asking you to come back for many more. Please, God. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, really excited, Professor Zvi Zohar is back next week to continue the series on Hacham Yisrael Moshe Hazan. And uh, we've got some very excited guests coming up. Obviously, the Rosh Bed Mizrahi Shabbat Dwek. We've got the Av Bed Din of Arabia, Senior Rabbi Eli Abadi, who's booked in for a class on classical Sephardi uh, for Skim, um, Rav Yoni Rosenzweig, etc., etc., and membership mode. Stay tuned, stay on the WhatsApp membership group because uh, in, in a few days you'll be getting all the details. Rav, again, thank you so, so much. Looking forward to thank you for having you back me. again. And everybody, good night. And Rav Halevi, I see you're here. I, I couldn't say good night without saying a big uh, uh, shalom to you. Uh, thank you for being here. And please I just want to say that Rav Halevi is a big inspiration to me. And uh, he also has many shiurim, Rav Yosef Mishash. And Kola uh, Kabot for all the work he does in spreading these beautiful gems that we have that people would, ne would never know except because of Rabbi uh, Halevi's shooting that he puts out. Thank you so much. 100%. And, Rabbi and I came I came because because Rabbi Chak is a big inspiration for me. I never sit through another person's shiur and I was here for a whole hour mesmerized. So chazak wow, wow, wow. I, I concur with what Rabbi Dugo said as well. Rabbi Yonatan Halevi has some fantastic uh, uh, classes. Everyone should check out Shiviti. Uh, please go to Rabbi Halevi as well. He's given shiurim and he, we, we booked him in for the membership mode as well. So it's great to see, you know, uh, all the... Chavarim, the Rabbanim, Dayanim, everyone together teaching uh, the Chavura, and please God may it continue. Thank you, everybody. Good night, good day, wherever you are. And Rabbi Dugos, thank you for extending the uh, allotted time. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. So much, everyone.